All right, so I'm gonna go through how to do additive manufacturing in Fusion 360, uh, specifically for directed energy deposition, uh, additive manufacturing, and we'll be doing a hybrid approach uh, because we'll be using a hybrid additive manufacturing machine. So um, first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pop into my project and I'm going to save our file, save a new file in here. Let's call it DED uh, tutorial. Let's call it sprocket. I like doing sprockets just because they're a relatively simple, non-overhanging geometry that we can create and we don't necessarily have to model it um, because we are going to use McMaster car to create our part here. So um, I'm going to search in here sprockets and we can pick kind of whatever geometry we want. We're just going to pick a regular roller chain sprocket and ten tooth. Let's see what that geometry looks like. That looks pretty good. Um, and then I'll go ahead and download it as a step file. And so this will be automatically pulled into Fusion, which is nice. It saves us a lot of time. Now, I don't want this geometry up top. Don't want that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to split this body using our splitting tool. I'm going to select that body. And for our splitting tool, I'm simply just going to select that top surface right there. Okay. Now we have two separate bodies in our feature. Oh, we actually have more than that. There we go. So there's our sprocket there. Uh, I'm going to remove these three bodies that we don't need anymore. Remove. And I use the remove rather than delete because it keeps it in our feature tree. If we ever wanted to add those back in, we could just go back to our timeline and remove those features. All right, so the next thing that we'll want to do is create a substrate material. Now, <clears throat> I like to create my substrate um, such that we only have to print the top half of the sprocket. I think that's really cool because it gives a nice um, split effect to it where half of the material will be printed and then the other half will be our substrate. So the way I'm going to go about doing that is we'll create a sketch on our original plane and we'll just create a circle here. The shape is relatively arbitrary. Um, we can have it in the machine however we want just as so long as it's uh, greater than two inches diameter so that when we go to print we have material to print on. Uh, and I'll just go negative an inch. Doesn't have to be. There's negative half inch. So that looks good. And uh, because I only want to print the top half of this sprocket, I'm going to do another split where I select the sprocket. And then for the splitting tool, I'll just pick the top plane of that substrate. And then I'll remove that other body. Okay. So now we have our substrate and we have the top half of our part to be printed. This is exactly what we need. Uh, before we go to the additive, we need to have the substrate material as well as our print feature <clears throat> in separate bodies. Now, this is going to print just fine. When it comes down to machining, we're going to have trouble getting that feature that's meant to be a broached feature. So <clears throat> we're not going to be able to hit that with our uh, end milling in the, the milling process, but that's okay we will do our best and it'll likely be that that feature is just excluded from the final geometry. So next thing we'll want to do is head over to manufacture. And this is where we'll do all our additive and subtractive tool paths. Um, because Fusion is set up for this, we can do all of our setups in one CAM file, which is really nice. So I'll go ahead and create a setup here. I, I switched over to the additive workspace. I created a setup. Um, by default, it does create a manufacturing model that you can edit. And that's really nice if you want to add extra material on so that 
model will be overbuilt and then you can machine away the, that excess material. Uh, with the additive process, you do have to select a machine and that's primarily because there are so many additive processes. You wanna make sure that you pick a machine that can be used for whatever process you're gonna be doing. So um, I already have a machine in here. Uh, this is built into the Iowa State Cloud Library. Um, this is our Ambit system. Um, you can see I've, I've edited it to have a picture of the system and dimensions and everything. Uh, I've also included uh, the relevant post-processor for the machine. And so when you go to post-process with this machine loaded, it will automatically select the post that I have in the machine in the machine file, I should say. <clears throat> so we'll be doing an additive operation here. The orientation of our model should be just as pictured. It's not super critical, um, but we will want to pick a spot that we can locate uh, easily without this part being made. So if we put a, a cylindrical block of steel in the machine, we can uh, we can find the center of that cylinder and also the top surface fairly easily. For our model, we'll need to select the body that we want to build. And for our stock, we'll also want to select our substrate material. So um, those are kind of the two main inputs. And then when you hit OK, cool, it brings in our model and we can see our substrate is the green material. That's our in-process stock. If you don't like that, you can turn it off here on the bottom. So with DED, the nice thing is you only really have one uh, construction mode that you can use, feature construction. And that's a good thing and kind of a downside, but that's kind of where it's at right now in Fusion. Um, we'll need to create a tool if you don't already have one. Now, I have already placed a couple different tools inside of the cloud library. Uh, for Iowa State. Um, the UMC 750 tools, that is the hybrid machine. Um, it has the two DED heads in there. And um, these are relatively, uh, relatively easy to use tools. Um, the main things that you want to note here are uh, your bead geometry, layer thickness. I just increased my layer thickness it's all dependent on the process parameters you use, so uh, you kind of have to play around with it. Uh, for this tool, I know one, one and a quarter millimeters works well for the powder flow rates that I'm going to be using. Uh, step over, that's just the, uh, the spacing between adjacent tracks. Feed rates, these are crucial. Um, this dictates how fast the tool is gonna move. Um, and it's in millimeters per minute, but you could also put in inches per minute. And then the, all of these process inputs down here are ignored. These are all part of the AMBIT system, uh, which is not connected to our G code. So you can put whatever you want in here. It's up to you as the operator to put in the correct values in the AMBIT system before you start. The ones that really matter, the ones that will, that will be in the G code, are these deposition geometry <clears throat> and the depositing feed rate. Uh, and then you wanna make sure you have the correct tool number and post processor. We hit accept. You can have different profiles for different materials, but we've only used stainless up to this point. So we'll use stainless steel 316. For our base selection, we need to select our substrate. So if I go to my manufacturing model, I need to make that visible, okay? And then I'll just select the plane that it's oriented on. So uh, we've got that plane, and then our feature that we wanna build is this, uh, this body. Um, by default, it only lets you select faces. Um, you could do uh, body selection, okay? And then you can just pick that body. That works, or you can go into the feature tree Either is fine. Let's turn on. There we go. Uh, if you were doing a, a three plus two operation, you might do tool orientation to change the orientation of the tool uh, just for this operation. 
Uh, with pipes, you don't usually need to mess around with anything. Um, the clearance and retract height, not really important to you right now. Um, and then in our passes tab, this is kind of the, the bread and butter for our process parameter control. Um, so step over, we can see is pulling in from the tool library. We have a couple of options for tool pathing. We can do infill and perimeters. And then our layering is also pulled in from our, or should be pulled in from our tool path library. So um, tool layer thickness. Okay, it doesn't like that. So we'll just leave that as one millimeter. And we want to do the entire feature. You could just do a limit, limited number of layers. That would be useful if like you wanted to deposit like two layers and then switch to a different recipe or a different operation, uh, whatever you name it. You can, you can kind of define your deposition however you want. So uh, other options here, if you wanted to do non-planar deposition, uh, you can do uh, off axis stuff, which is interesting. I've had really good luck with it for wire feed tooling. Um, adding a lead or a lean to get the machine to always print, either pushing or always pulling the wire. Uh, otherwise, it, it's kind of machine agnostic um, or process or direction agnostic. Um, and then we shouldn't have to mess with anything in retraction. So there we go. It generates our tool path here. Now we are going to have an issue because it's going to look very ugly and we're going to have spaces where it's just printing a little dot rather than a continuous path. And that's okay. Uh, this would print just fine and I'm sure we could machine it. Um, uh, I being the um, savvy manufacturing engineer that I am, I want to create a contour or a perimeter on there. And so <clears throat> I'm going to add perimeter in our feature construction. I am going to add a gap width in there. Um, and let's call that tool bead width, bead width, uh, let's say divided by two. And mm, let's do one inward offset just for fun. Um, this will just give us a little bit, a little bit better dimensional control. Okay, and there we go. We're getting a much better feature definition, and so that's that's good. Um, so we've got our tool path, and the next step is to export it, so into G code, so we can get it into our machine. And so. The way we'll do that is through post-processing, just like we do on a subtracted toolpath. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, we've got our AMBIT system in here. That's good. We can use that uh, in our machine, and it automatically pulls in our post-processor. Um, I like to usually name my files uh, with my initials and then the date, uh, the two-digit month, and then two-digit two day. And then I just add a letter at the end of it because Usually I screw up the first one and then I'll need to do it again. And so the second, the second file will have B at the end, the third one will have C, and then uh, so on and so forth so I can keep uh, version control going. Um, our machine works in inches. This should be specified in the post processor. And you should be good to post. And then when it's done posting, it will pop up with our NC code, or it will pop up with a notification to view your NC code, rather. Um, and this is all present in our G code. This is our G code that it just created. And it's a, it's a very important step here to verify that the code is right. Um, I like to do that by doing just a dummy check. I'll search for M6, M06. Great, it's not doing any tool changes. M3, calling M30, that's okay. M03, okay. M4, and M04, good. So it's not calling any tool changes, not calling any uh, spindle on commands or spindle off commands. 
that's good. Um, that just ensures that when we go to print, uh, we can uh, rest easy knowing that it's not going to do any unexpected tool changes or anything. Um, one of the other things that we should check here is that it's applying our tool length compensation. If it doesn't apply your tool length compensation or your tool, tool length compensation gets canceled, you're going to have a bad day. Um, and so we can fairly well assume that it's going to be okay in here, but we'll just double check. Our G43 is our tool height compensation, tool length compensation. <clears throat> and we can see that's being applied here. And that is just fine. We are not descending in Z before we get to that line. And then we can search for a G49 because that would cancel it. We're not seeing that anywhere in here. Uh, other things that might cancel it, uh, G28, we're not seeing that until the very end. Um, and that's a home move that's going to move it to the top of the z-axis, so, so that's not worrisome at all. Um, so those are the major things. Other things that we can check for are just making sure that the format of this is correct, or at least semi-correct. So um, we turn media on, we wait 20 seconds. Um, I believe that needs to be changed. Well, it may be okay. I don't know. It depends how your machine reads inches or, uh, or sorry, seconds or milliseconds on the uh, dwell commands. Um, we're applying smoothing, moving to XY, applying our work height offset, moving down in Z. We turn media on again, and we're doing a, a lead in move here, and then we turn the laser on. And while the laser is on, we're going to do all of these movements until we get to our lead out. Then we'll turn the laser off. So that looks good. And the rest of the code should just be a sequence of leading in, turning the laser on, uh, doing a bunch of moves, turning the laser off. It should be as simple as that. And if we go through the code, we can check to make sure that's the case, especially once we get to the infill, which is uh, lead in. Sorry, media on, lead in, laser on, do some moves, laser off, lead out. Uh, it turns it on twice there. So that's a bug that I need to fix. Um, it shouldn't have the laser on there. Luckily, it's only doing it there, although it might do it later. So there's a reason we check this, um, because there could be bugs in the, in the software. Yeah, there it is again. So that'll be something that I need to go through and fix. Um, realistically, I don't think it's going to harm anything. Although it's always a good check to go to NC Viewer, paste your code, plot it, there we go, and see what it's doing. So we're down at the bottom here where we ran into that error. Uh, so we turn laser on, laser off, we have laser on, we do a move, we turn laser on again, we do a move, and we turn laser off. So that's going to be okay. Um, it's just a funky looking, um, a funky looking command there that's causing it to leave the laser on. So I'm not too worried about that, but um, that is something that we might want to look out for. In, during the actual printing process and then make corrections to the post processor afterwards. So I think that looks good. I'm pretty satisfied with that. So the next step would be taking that to the hybrid machine and actually printing it. Um, and I can show how to do that in a subsequent video.